All right, so let's get started, huh? So uh, welcome to Decode Crypto, Trends, Securities, and Tax Issues. Um, my name is Donald Moore. I'm the chairman of the Hong Kong Association of New York, and I'll be your moderate moderator today. Uh, I'm also managing partner of U.S. Legal Advisors, uh, which is a law firm specializing on defense, uh, transportation, and infrastructure matters on Earth and in space. Um, <clears throat> Today we have uh, three excellent uh, presenters, um, but before I introduce them, give me uh, give you a few general reminders about how the um, the event's going to go today. So, uh, as you may have uh, experienced in many other Zoom presentations, uh, we will um, uh, we will do uh, presentations and then we'll do Q and A at the end. And so, uh, if you have questions. There's a Q&A panel at the bottom, which no doubt you're familiar with. The chat function is merely for communicating with the administration for uh, the admin for the event in case you have a technical question about something. But all the questions, please put in the Q&A panel. At the meeting today, the event today is going to be recorded for promotional purposes. And um, uh, there'll be a short survey sent to everybody who signed up. So uh, your responses and your comments on that help us uh, make our events better. So uh, we'd appreciate you responding to that. And uh, please note that all comments made in the program do not necessarily represent the official views of the speakers or their employers, or as the guy who runs the um, cybersecurity podcast says, or their dogs or even themselves three weeks from now. I always think that's a funny line. So um, today, uh, again, my name is Donald Moore. I'll be your moderator. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, speakers all at once, and then we'll introduce them uh, one by one as we go forward. Um, the event is put on by the Hong Kong Association of New York and the Hong Kong Association of Northern California, um, part of a global federation of Hong Kong associations um, covering issues uh, relating to investment and business in Hong Kong. Um, uh, we can skip past this. I've already uh, said uh, who I am. And so our three speakers uh, start, we'll start with um, uh, Jess Taylor. So Jess is somebody I've known for a little while. Uh, he, he gladly um, uh, and thankfully uh, volunteered to help us today. Uh, so he is the founder of AirPass, which is A-E-R-P-A-S-S, -S, which is an early stage company with the world's most secure authentication solution for combating cyber fraud and protecting individual privacy online. Uh, it's in the middle of its uh, sourcing its A round for investment uh, to support the rollout of top global retail brands and includes a discount program for veteran and active duty family members. Uh, he also has experience designing a private blockchain solution and uh, um, uh, the formation of initial, initial coin offerings. So he's going to give us an overview of, <clears throat> of some of the blockchain, some crypto issues, and some of the trends in the market. So after Jess is done, uh, we will then move on to Eric Sibbett. Eric um, is a partner in Paul Hastings. Uh, for most of you will know that's a, a, a large and prominent law firm. And Eric uh, is a partner in their securities and capital markets and fintechs and payments se uh, sections of the law firm. And he's based out of the San Francisco office and he's a, a global leader advising on fintech platforms and space. And then finally, we'll have Mr. Ryan Robotham, uh, who has 40 years experience in international tax and uh, partner in the tax department uh, in, a, a, in the a tax group at Crow, which he uh, recently uh, retired from and now is a consultant. Uh, so we're gonna be covering um, uh, general trends and issues relating to crypto and how, legal matters and how some of these issues are dealt with legally and then tax matters, which are all you know, really fast moving areas of, of crypto. And so we expect to have a good, robust conversation. And then we'll be following up with Q&A at the end. So um, do we have another slide?
Michelle, are we are we stuck on this this slide here? No, we're we're all good right now. Like um, oh, okay, right sorry, I just saw the, the logo. So um, <clears throat> this is the Hong Kong Association um, logo, and uh, so we're good to go and start. And so I'd like to reintroduce Jess Taylor, and Jess is going to speak about anywhere from 10 to 15, 17 minutes, whatever he likes. And um, uh, so please, please go ahead, Jess. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jess Taylor. I'm the president founder of AirPass, as Don so graciously described it, the world's most secure personal identity uh, for online transactions uh, and eventually in brick and mortar space as well. Um, <clears throat> My background and relationship with crypto is directly um, comes directly out of the experience that we had um, applying our technology to protect the space. Uh, so learned a lot about it over the course of the past several uh, years. Um, but we'll give a little primer for you on the where the market's been, uh, where it's currently at, and where it's headed. So uh, for those uh, who are uninitiated, uh, crypto got started back with a white paper published uh, under the pseudonym of Hitoshi Nakamura uh, back in 2008, describing a peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, system. <clears throat> the methodology behind that uh, came to be known as the blockchain. Uh, essentially is the first instance of zero trust architecture uh, in between uh, uh, computer systems that uh, would allow people to affect peer-to-peer -peer transactions uh, without worry of fraud <clears throat> based on cryptographic hashing algorithms. So flash forward a few years, uh, the novelty uh, has given rise to an entire movement called Web 3.0 and hundreds of altcoins as they're called have been <clears throat> released into the wild, into the marketplace. Uh, these altcoins all represent an individual blockchain. Uh, and blockchain can most simply be described as a massively distributed ledger. In other words, everyone has a copy of the same database and all the transactions that are in that database are recorded across all the servers that maintain a copy of this database. <clears throat> servers compete to write new blocks to the ledger that record transactions uh, that describe the uh, that describe transfers of assets that are linked to these coins. In the case of Bitcoin, it's just the coin. So you're moving literally the asset itself uh, or some fractional uh, fraction of the asset to other wallets on the chain. Uh, there are additional <clears throat> blockchains that have given rise to uh, computational <clears throat> affects uh, like Ethereum, uh, which allows for a number of smart contracts, they're called, that actually if, that don't necessarily track Ethereum itself, but are tracking transfers of items, wealth, um, claims amongst other people. Uh, and the blockchain is a way of tracking those claims. Uh, so it's created this whole asset class in, in uh, coins and altcoins. Uh, and as with any new asset, uh, there is quite a lot of growth, um, but the growth comes in fits and starts because there's quite a lot of uh, volatility in the market as has been evidenced from the incredible growth of Bitcoin from a um, market cap of zero, not even marginal, to over a trillion dollars last year and now back down to um, near eight as of yesterday. Um, this is, uh, needless to say, the global market is rapidly expanding. And uh, for those who hodl, which is hold on for dear life to cryptos that they acquire along the way, um, the future does indeed look bright um, as the trend uh, seemingly defies all expectations and continues to grow in momentum. Um, initially, there were only a few chains a few years ago uh, and again, I said that there was a proliferation to hundreds of different chains and hundreds of different coins uh, or tokens as they're called. <clears throat> and um, that's given rise to uh, exchanges 
where coins and tokens are traded uh, for real fiat currency or for other coins and tokens. The largest of these exchanges, Binance, is actually uh, headquartered out of Hong Kong. Uh, so tip of the hat there. <clears throat> um, but the, the top, um, top 10 or so read uh, like a who's who of people you've never heard of before. Binance, Coinbase, Exchange, FTX, Kraken, Qcoin, Hobby Global, Gate.io, Bitfinex, Gemini, and Crypto.com, whose ads you may have seen uh, during recent events like the Super Bowl. <clears throat> These exchanges and the uh, chains that they represent are the principal uh, location for buying and selling trading of blockchain. Now, the thing about blockchain is that you can also um, directly purchase the assets off, off of exchanges. Uh, all you need is a wallet. So because of this decentralized nature, um, there is plenty of room for numerous <laughs> numerous additional means by which people can uh, participate in this asset class. Uh, you can literally write a, a new blockchain uh, just by you know, writing the programming that uh, causes it to operate. Distributing that programming to other so-called nodes on the chain, minting coins, and then creating something called an initial coin offering. And this would be a release of those coins to the public in an initial function. Now you need to, in order to do this, you need to set up economics, uh, which define uh, the relative scarcity of the token. Um, but that was a major trend over the past four or five years. And that's what caused these uh, relative explosion in new coins. Um, the newest trend is NFTs. So <clears throat> remember I said that blockchain is a distributed ledger. So it's a, basically everybody, it's a very public and indisputable and immutable proof of ownership of a given asset by some given wallet. Think of it like a Swiss bank account. It's literally just a number. But <clears throat> that owner, that holder uh, is absolutely definitive. So NFTs or non-fungible tokens are a new novel way uh, to build on certain blockchains like Ethereum the claims of ownership that any one person or a group of people, if they're using fractional NFTs, might have to a specific digital asset. The asset could also be a physical asset, but at present, NFTs are, may, are mainly focused on digital assets. <clears throat> this is where we start to rub, rub, brush right up against uh, our next panelist who will be speaking about the securities implications of these things. Um, I wanna be clear about this. Block, uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies aren't actually currencies. Um, they don't meet a, a number of the requirements to be a currency, uh, even stable coins like Tether. Um, it, it is uh, remain to be seen <clears throat> whether these uh, will weather the test of time and uh, eventually basically reach the level of acceptance and stability required to actually be a, a considered a currency. So consider them if you look as you're looking at um, blockchain assets as an asset class, a highly volatile one, um, but an asset class nonetheless. Um, most of the coins are, are not securities. They're literally just commodities. <clears throat> and the NFT is a way of getting around securities regulations because it is the closest equivalent in the blockchain chain world you can think of to a deed. So this is the big trend moving forward because securities regulations are notoriously glacial in catching up to the new technologies uh, that are being put forward every month, it seems, in the crypto space. And uh, until we get a really good and well-rounded and well-defined uh, set of securities regulations that can be agreed upon, not just here in the States, but across the major trading zones in the world, um, we're gonna see a further explosion of NFTs because they're, described, they're basically descriptive of unique assets. And so, whereas a security would be a fractional ownership in a single item or a single company, 
An NFT is actually an ownership of a thing. So its uniqueness is what gives it uh, the ability to dodge securities laws. <clears throat> so um, looking forward, um, I would like to say that I have a crystal ball <laughs> that I could tell you uh, which direction the overall market's uh, going to head in the next quarter, uh, six months, 12 months, five years. Um, I think the best way to describe this would be uh, something that was said by and attributed to, to Hitoshi Nakamura himself is that this thing is either going to be, and he was speaking about Bitcoin, worth an amazing amount one day or it's going to go to zero. I would tend to think that the future is bright for blockchain. You just have to pick the right horse. Jess, well, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we will uh, go uh, over to the legal aspect soon. I mean, the coin offerings and that, that, that were quite hot for yeah, several years when they were sort of free of securities uh, scrutiny, it seemed. Um, I'm assuming um, those offerings have slowed down even the ones that were on the more credible end of the range, as opposed to the ones that were, you know, dodgy, I per, to use your word, yeah. Yeah, well, dodgy is actually one of the coins. <laughs> yeah. yeah no. No, it's Do, Do, uh, Doge coin was a joke, um, but the ICO uh, created a new crypto and was quite there successful. Is. Yeah, you're right. The, the ICO market has uh, basically frozen. It's all that dried up and went off a cliff uh, in early 2020. That was it. I mean, it was on its way down in 2019 when the pandemic hit. Um, people started getting into NFTs. So there are, there are some uh, securities, um, we'll say securities regulated type exchanges uh, that are nascent. Um, nascent being they you know they literally just started within the last few years 2017 2018 time frame and um, those uh, specific trading platforms um, exist to to promote and to list securities tokens um, and they are they're kind of pushing a rock up a boulder uphill right now it's uh, slow going uh, but once the you know, once regulation is more well-defined around uh, securities offerings that are tokenized, as we say, um, we, I expect that those uh, digital-only exchanges will, uh, they'll grow quite a bit. Right, well, that's a good segue to Eric. Eric's gonna give us an overview of many of the legal issues uh, surrounding crypto. And so I turn it over to Eric. Great. Pull up the slides here. Okay, great. So that that was a, a great uh, segue from Jess into what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, which really the, the legal aspects of, um, of digital assets and blockchain. So if we kind of move forward here, um, you know, maybe kind of go to the next slide. One of the, the fundamental issues with digital assets is really is like, what, what are they, right? So um, there are a lot of different types of digital assets. People use a lot of different definitions and think about these in a lot of different ways. Uh, depending on how we classify these you know, the, you know, digital assets and what features they have, it will have different sorts of regulatory Im implications. So just to kind of talk through this very quickly at a high level, um, you know, we have, you know, have this notion of a virtual currency, something that's a digital representation of value that you can use it as a medium of exchange. Uh, store value, a unit of account, et cetera. Example, that would be like a central bank digital currency. Um, we have what we refer to our cryptocurrencies, uh, a type of virtual currency that is essentially using cryptography to help validate and secure transactions. Um, some of the prominent examples out there, um, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, et cetera. Uh, stable coins, which are a really important part of the, the, the ecosystem. Uh, it really is kind of the, you know, in many cases, the the digital equivalent of a dollar or a unit of gold or another currency, uh, where it's really something that's intended, unlike the, the volatility you see with a lot of digital assets that maintain a stable value so that you have some sort of 
really kind of common uh, way of, of interacting um, and, and kind of you often see this paired with other sorts of, of digital assets as, as things um, are, are traded. Security tokens, which was suggested at the end where really something is, it's expressly built to be a security, right? It is something that is um, the digital version of common stock is providing a right to a distribution, it's providing voting rights. One of the, the interesting things we can do with, with digital assets that are, are a little bit more difficult to do with traditional assets is we can automate a lot of this in the smart contract and carve things up in new and interesting ways to enable, uh, you know, enable distributions of various kinds. Utility tokens. Uh, we see a lot of talk about utility tokens in the digital asset space. This is really, you know, regardless of, of the fact there is a lot of speculation out there, I hope that uh, digital assets increase in value. Most of the time, digital assets, they're built to do something, right? They, they help to, you know, they're modules of software. They have to help to enable a new ecosystem. They have some function, they provide governance, et cetera. And so what is unique and distinct from a classic security is that additional functionality that's coming out of, out of, uh, out of a token. It's really been built to do something. And then it was indicated at the end, um, something that's kind of emerged uh, increasing pop, pop, uh, popularity more recently, NFTs, non-fungible tokens which are interesting when we talk about a lot of cryptocurrency and digital assets, these are really just fungible things, things where you can trade them uh, and, 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 and they're, they're not unique. A dollar is a dollar, right? Uh, what is interesting about non-fungible tokens is that these really are intended to represent some unique form of ownership. And they can really, it, it can be anything. I mean, the kind of classic cases are like an, an ownership of, of an image, a JPEG, et cetera. But because this can represent ownership of anything, it can actually represent ownership of all the other things that are on this list, right? It can represent ownership of a, of a derivative, of a, of, a, of a security, et cetera. And so these present a lot of interesting questions. But if we move forward to the next slide, um, the, you know, the, the classic question that, that is largely grappled with in the US is, are the securities laws? So, when, whenever anything is a security, the types of regulations, how you offer it, who can offer it, uh, what disclosures come with it, what your liabilities are, are all, all kind of keyed off of the question of whether something is or is not a security. And in the context of digital assets, that, that's a, often a difficult determination. Now, the SEC has a very broad view uh, in terms of, of what potentially constitutes a, a security. And, in some cases, that may be that everything other than, than Bitcoin and, and ETH are securities. Uh, we do have kind of long-standing tests for looking at this, um, but these are tests that are that are very old. The classic test goes back to 1946, tied to analysis of, of orange groves, and really kind of trying to apply this into the new world of a new technology uh, presents a lot of challenges. And so we've actually, you know, as, as part of this process, really looked through thousands of different digital assets through frameworks like this to try to look at something where it falls on a scale in terms of the risk that something is or is not a security. But going to the next slide, um, and, and we're not gonna go through all of this, right? But, but the interesting thing about digital assets, blockchain and crypto is, I mean, obviously whenever we're doing anything that touches on financial services or the financial system, that is one of the most highly regulated areas of, of most economies, right? The financial markets are a common good uh, highly, highly regulated, right? A lot of the, the regulations all, uh, focus on regulating intermediaries. So we think about banks, insurance companies, broker, brokerage firms, um, you know, money transmitters, different categories of intermediaries. And so a lot of the way governments try to police their regulatory objectives is say, we're regulating a bank. So you're a bank, you have to do certain things. You have to have reserves. Um, if you are, um, you know, functioning like a mutual fund, an investment company, there are certain requirements apply. If you're going to touch securities and enable transacting in securities, you have to be a broker dealer. And when we take something that's entirely new and then in many ways helps to disintermediate those traditional players, right, when it may be more efficient for me to transact directly with someone else or raise something, raise money directly from someone else, that has really radical implications for regulators and regulations uh, that really are, are really continuing to play out and will play out for a long period of time as we think about how to, how to effectively re-regulate. And so again, when we take anything new, you know, as an attorney, 
you, you say take something new, you take old legacy financial regulations and you try to how to fit the, how to see how those things fit, creates a lot of interesting novel and uh, you know, novel legal questions uh, and judgment calls, which people are, you know, who, people are trying to innovate and build businesses um, are, are really trying to navigate that, that uncertainty. So we won't kind of go through this, but it really touches almost every area of law when we're talking about digital assets. So moving forward to the next slide, um, this is just a snapshot. Um, you know, obviously, you know, there's a lot, there have been a lot of developments, but just kind of give you a sense of kind of how the regulatory environment has emerged and evolved in the US. Um, this is obviously very SEC centric, but I think it's useful to have some, some sense of this. So just kind of starting off high level, we had something called the Dow report in 2017, which is really, really the formal uh, shot across the bow from the SEC say, saying, we think a lot of these things, uh, you know, or maybe all these things are offers and sales of securities. 2017 was a big boom in the, the so-called ICO or initial coin offering. And this was really kind of the warning shot to let people know, okay, th this, this is an area, consult with your lawyers. We think a lot of these things are securities, et cetera. Um, that continued to play out through Enforcement Act and other activities over time. In 2019, after some other munching, some other, you know, some, some other actions that came out, there was kind of a more, more formal um, analysis, really kind of the first time to like put it in a, a kind of an official format rather than trying to read, read the tea leaves from a speech, et cetera, a framework on, on investment contract analysis. An investment contract is the test in the US for fuzzy things that don't fall in the normal dis, def, def, definition of traditional securities. So that came out, got a lot of attention. Um, you know, some other events as we go along the way, you know, enforcement action launched against Ripple Labs, one of the most XRP associated with that, one of the most prominent cryptocurrencies. In 2021, uh, we saw the, the direct, direct listing of Coinbase, which was really kind of a, an important uh, watershed event for the industry in that you actually had a crypto company, a prominent crypto company that was able to go through an SEC registration and become public. Um, I was played a small role in that one, but it was really kind of a, an important development in terms of where things were emerging. Um, 2021, we also saw the emergence so of the appointment of a new uh, SEC chairman. Um, and then we see throughout this, these periods, like you know, kind of cadence of enforcement actions, sometimes rightfully focused on things like fraud, right, where people have really been harmed. Sometimes the more technical violation where the SEC or other regulators are trying to send the message that, hey, we have rules, we expect you to follow them, and we think that they apply here. Bitmax, another prominent example here, and another one where we start to see kind of more coordination, um, CFTC, FinCEN, SEC, some of the regulators working together as they think about how they're going to approach these, these digital, asset, um, digital asset markets. Uh, more recently, um, 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 President's Working Group report on stable coins, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of these issues. But, but you know, stable coins have emerged to become these these massive, massively you know large um, billion dollar pools of assets, right? And um, this was important in that it was the kind of the first time we had kind of a more of a call it a formal executive recognition of crypto. A lot of the um, kind of actions kind of kind of have been kind of negative and kind of a comment off and kind of off the cup comment here and there, et cetera. This is really important. We're saying, okay, this is kind of a multi-agency coordination process where we're going to think about what this means and how it can be regulated. So in the context of stable coins, um, you know, it, it's it's significant. The US is used to controlling the US dollar, right? So the US controls the, the money supply. You see this in kind of the concern over sanctions, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, there's this question and a little bit of regulatory competition here in terms of how are we going to start to regulate this? So if you have a large reserve um, backing a stable coin and there's no legal regime around that, it creates concerns for regulators like is the money, you know, is the money really there? Is it being used in a safe way? Is it really truly a reserve? And so as you have different regulators thinking about this, the SEC may be raising their hand saying, hey, we think this should be registered like an investment company, right? Um, or bank bank saying, OCC saying, okay, we think you need to be a bank to do this, right? And so you see a lot of different kind of competition and people saying, well, I think this goes down this regulatory lane versus a different regulatory lane, but people kind of thinking about how to get it right, right? 
Next thing we have on this list here, uh, you know, BlockFi settlement, another very significant uh, uh, moment for regulation. Um, this is, you know, what has become very, very popular within the digital asset space is, is, is are, are different types of products where you earn returns, yield, interest, dividends, rewards uh, from the use of your digital assets. So if you have, for example, you put them in an account, um, maybe a centralized platform will pay a, a reward or return for you for keeping your digital assets in a certain location. Maybe it will be an in intermediary, which is then lending those to people who need to use those digital assets. That's something where a lot of the position has been that those are not um, subject to securities laws within the industry. Block by settlement, yeah, SEC uh, came out and said, yes, we think these are investment contracts. This is regulated. And BlockFi agreed to pay a penalty and um, kind of go through some, some sort of a registration process, which is still unfolding. Um, it's also you know, notable in that we often think about federal regulation, um, but states in, in the United States, we have every state has its own um, you know, version of you know, state securities laws, et cetera. And, and we have multiple regulators from red states, blue states, et cetera. Uh, that um, are are um, you know kind of kind of active in making inquiries and undertaking activities, and then finally and more recently, and actually I think there's a little bit of a positive spin. This one, executive order from the Biden from Biden administration, March 2022, on ensuring responsible developments of digital assets, and this is important as an executive order, not so much in that it it said anything kind of new or announced any substantive regulation. But it really is kind of a regulation that um, there's actually real value and utility um, and innovation happening here that's important, right? Um, but we need to think about the best way to regulate this and the best way to coordinate among regulatory agencies in terms of how to do that. And so a lot of people knew this was coming and thought, okay, we're a little bit worried about what this is going to look like. But actually when it came out, it kind of was a little bit of a recognition that, that digital assets, crypto blockchain is here to stay as an innovation. And we just have to figure out the right way to, to, to regulate this. And so the last part I'm just gonna talk about, and we touched on a little bit about this, and this is, this is really about kind of highlighting some of the things, certainly from a regulatory perspective in terms of market trends that I think you know, sort of are, are interesting or, or really important. So we talked about, I said a little bit about NFTs. So NFTs, NFTs are, are significant. Um, and, and actually, when we talk about Web3, as, as Jess was discussing, what's really interesting about NFTs is they, they, um, they touch people in a much broader way uh, than, than digital assets. So for a lot of people, the notion of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies sounds scary and exotic and kind of Kind of, kind of the purview of financial traders or, 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 or kind of deeply technical people. NFTs are something where you know you, 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 it becomes part of your identity, right? So if you have the right to show something, your whether it's kind of your favorite moment from a, some dunking a basketball, a, a, a character, something that becomes part of your identity, and so it immediately becomes retail and um, something that people associate with in a more personal way than something like a fungible cryptocurrency. And so, but what is interesting here is, is we see NFTs continue to evolve and innovate. So, so we see a lot of NFTs where, for example, maybe you have a, a piece of digital art, right? And that piece of digital art by itself, not a, not a security, right? But then we see things where, okay, well, we'll fractionalize it. And then maybe if you purchase some of this, you're a member of an investment club, right? And then the proceeds or a royalty stream from this will start to come in. And that creates, starts to create new securities law issues. And so this is a really interesting area and an area where we're starting to see a lot of like bridging from different areas. You know, I spend a lot of time in Southern California these days because of the, the nexus between entertainment and NFTs, right? And so this is really kind of a kind of an interesting area. Stable coins, we talked about a little bit. Again, the, the big question here is now that we have these giant pools of money. What's the best way to regulate them, and 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 how should they be regulated under existing kind of regimes, or should there be new new ones? There was a, a recent proposal in Congress to kind of basically create a new type of regulatory regime for stablecoins, and um, and so this is going to be an interesting interesting one to watch because it's really having these stablecoins at the center of an ecosystem is really important for them for for a crypto economy to be able to function. 
Uh, yield products, we mentioned this in the context of, of BlockFi. Again, you have, um, you have crypto digital assets competing with traditional you know, bank accounts, other forms of, of, of holding money securely and earning interest. And that's creating a lot of, quite a lot, a lot of questions like how do we, how do we regulate that? Um, DAOs, uh, a very interesting phenomenon. A lot of this, as we kind of mentioned, this is, this is on the, on the related to DeFi as well. A lot of what crypto and blockchain is enabling is taking out those, those central players, those central intermediaries, and al allowing people to come together. In, in some cases, a DAO uh, distributed autonomous organization can be more like an investment club where we have a bunch of people, we're coming together, uh, we're pooling our funds, and we're going to buy some iconic pieces of art. We're going to we're going to buy something at auction at, at Sotheby's or Christie's, um, and and then we're going to build something around it. Or we decided, you know, rather than having like a, an old notion of a company or corporation that is going to go into control things, um, we're going to decide this together as a community. And this is a way where we can govern and vote and participate and make things happen, more like an old grassroots form notion, but done on a global basis, right? And so. But it does create a lot of interesting and, and complicated questions as you try to put this in a in a in a in a normal a kind of tip, traditional legal regime in terms of you know what are people's you know personal liabilities or tax liabilities for participation in a DAO and how it's structured. A lot of interesting areas there. DeFi, um, just the high level theme there is is really is is it you know decentralized finance when we take out those central intermediaries and we enable things to happen in a new way. Um, how do we make that work in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a, a, a regulated ecosystem? So one thing there, for example, um, you know, for example, you, if, we're, if, we're, if we're dealing with a bank or a securities brokerage firm, they will do money laundering, um, OFAC checks, making sure people are not on bad persons list as part of the process of onboarding customers. If you create a decentralized protocol, which allows anybody to, to transact with anybody else, suddenly you, you lose that player that's playing that role in the ecosystem, which is helping to make sure that, you know, things don't go for terrorist financing, other, other sorts of things. When you take it into DeFi, and now we're seeing hybrids, right, right, where you have, okay, yes, this is a protocol that allows people anonymously to transact, but we're creating little walled gardens of people that have been verified through a, uh, you know, a third party Oracle, that they're not on a bad person's list. And we don't know who those people are, but we know that they are like, you know, safe. And we see this particularly now as a lot of more traditional registered investment advisors, uh, investors want to participate in this ecosystem, uh, but they have regulatory obligations and they're trying to figure out the best way to navigate and, and do that and kind of, kind of tap into this excitement. Things like funding loans, right? So, so if you're a, you're a lender, you obviously have to source your capital, make the loans. Now people are, are to some extent looking at um, you know, you know, different forms of, of digital asset projects as a way of getting the financing so that they can make then make loans in various countries throughout the world. Last thing, and then we'll kind of kind of move to uh, to, to Brian. Uh, and this has got a lot of attention recently is, um, you know, sort of the role of, of, of cryptocurrency in um, you know, potentially evading sanctions, um, um, kind of, and, and how that's unfolding. And so there are a lot of um, a lot of players within the cryptocurrency ecosystem trying to figure out, you know, how do we how do we navigate these kind of questions? You know, how do we be, make sure that we are a good actor and perceived as a good actor while still continuing to enable the kinds of innovation and kind of free flow um, of of of, um, of of transactions, um, you know, kind of without kind of burdening us with a lot of these other obligations. So. This is something that's really kind of coming up as people decide, well, who can I transact with? If I'm, if I'm a centralized intermediary, do I have to close certain accounts, et cetera? And so this was just kind of a sample of a lot of the things that we're seeing now that are big issues. Um, but I'll, I'll pause there. I'm gonna kind of move, move, move on, but uh, just want to give you a teaser. We could probably talk about this for a few hours. And so this is just a, again, kind of a, a snapshot of some of the stuff that's going on. Um, so Don, can you unmute yep, yourself? There please? we go. So uh, thank you so much. A, there was a lot covered in there, and a lot to, could be covered for you know hours and days on end. I'm sure, right? Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a lawyer. Uh, as, but kind of my side hustle. It's like uh, on the weekends, and my day job is CEO of a space company. And um, but the thing, those two things kind of 
interacted a little bit recently and they touch on, at least from my perspective, issue of smart contracts. And uh, I kind of tend to see, I'm curious how much activity there are in smart contracts that are portrayed as this great solution to like automatic payments, automatic settlements of things that happen. But I think of them a little more as kind of very sophisticated and efficient letters of credit. If something happens, you deliver something, that something else happens and you get your money. Um, and my example comes out of the space side. So we have a customer who was putting up a satellite on a Soyuz rocket. And you could have written a, a smart contract about it, but you never would have guessed the Russians would have invaded Ukraine and kind of, you know, uh, upset every component of who's at fault and what happens then. And so it strikes me that smart contracts still have that issue that it's kind of like, you know, you got to put in the right information, otherwise a smart contract also doesn't work. So in that context, has that, has, has that really been adopted in a big way yet, smart contracts? So I think, I mean, it's it's been adopted to a significant extent, but it's got a long way to go, right? Yeah. Right, because you're right. So even if you can hardwire, um, you know, you know, if A happens, then then B is the result, right? If the weather is above 86 degrees on Tuesday, then I'll pay you, you know, this this amount of Bitcoin, right? Um, you 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 still need, right? You need someone, an oracle, a note, someone to verify that yeah. that's in fact what happened, right? Yeah. Right. You have a dispute so, about that, of course, right? Yeah. Right. And so that could be, you know, in some cases it could be, a, you know, it could be a centralizing. I mean, this is how it works in the traditional world. If someone, there's, you know, someone decides, yes, that happened. So I'll pay you. Right. right. Um, um, or you could, you know, you basically in a lot of these, well, you'll, you'll put it out there to the community. Right. And it's kind of the wisdom of the crowd and people are doing the right thing. Right. Or a kind of a, a closed loop, closed system of, of experts, et cetera. But there's still a lot of those questions out there. And then when you get the situation where it's not black and white, Right, and this was not built into like that. That does raise very interesting questions, and whether there's really an override or or how that's actually going to function. So a lot of interesting questions there, and, and it's particularly if something on a meltdown scenario, who's responsible, and then how you unwind things when you know transactions yeah. are supposed to be irreversible. And, and does a smart contract cover that really efficiently? Even like is it 86 degrees? Well, yeah, but we didn't count for the fact that the other side of the party went and bribed the. Uh, you know, the weather station people and they recorded the wrong degree and then the con contract paid out and then there's a lawsuit over it. I mean, it's kind of exaggerated, but so, uh, well, thank you all for that. Uh, thank you for all of that. Uh, so now we're gonna move on to Brian. And, and in fact, I think there was equally interesting tax consequences uh, and evolving tax issues in crypto. And Brian's gonna tell us all about it. Thanks very much, uh, Don. Well, okay. so. Um... Hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, the whole crypto area, I, uh, clearly it's not going to disappear. Uh, my first client uh, that I was referred to is actually 2017. I feel like uh, five years ago. It's almost, it feels like 20 years in the crypto environment. So this individual was a senior commodities trader in, in Chicago for a major bank. And so he was basically setting up a platform in the cloud to mirror the Chicago Board Commodities Exchange, he was going to issue tokens so you could be trading in the cloud. And uh, so I looked at this structure and well, you're not actually trading, you're not taking ownership. It's really just a kind of a derivative that looks at the prices and you're buying and selling. And I said, uh, yeah, that just sounds like gambling. You're not taking any ownership. And, and the guy looked at me and he says, well, isn't that what the stock market is anyway? <laughs> But the, the okay. key issue was uh, trading on a commodities exchange, huge commissions. So when you're moving money, when you're doing transactions, the, uh, they, I guess they call it the gas fees in the crypto arena, uh, the transaction costs are significant. And so crypto actually significantly cuts those transaction costs down. So the, the big banks at first were afraid of it. Now they're starting to get into it because they realize it's not going to go away. And, and the difference, different platforms and the cost structures are huge. So Bitcoin and Ethereum are very expensive in terms of the transaction fees. That's why you'll see crypto.com. Their, their fees may be one tenth. And so they're, they're taking off because they're basically able to significantly discount to their, their investors. 
Um, what you have on the front page, I decided to stake my son uh, a year ago. And, and so uh, occasionally I check in and see, well, how's my investment doing? <laughs> so I said, let's, let's see what kind of NFTs you've got. And so he sent me these pictures of NFTs and uh, the top left and the bottom right are, are what are referred to as mad meerkats. And if you remember the Lion King, there were meerkats. And so these things started a, about a, a year and a half ago. And at least according to my son, I haven't checked the pricing out. Uh, he invested a few hundred dollars, and now those those two meerkat images are worth five thousand dollars each. Now, uh, intrinsically, uh, you get in these chat clubs, uh, support groups, a new platform comes out, and you really can't tell where the values are, are going to head. Uh, I saw in the Wall Street Journal recently, Bill Gates uh, and Elon Musk were debating, and Bill Gates said. Anybody who doesn't have a lot of spare change or isn't significantly wealthy should stay out of uh, the NFT area. Elon Musk, you know, oh, that's a pretty good, it's one of the options to consider investing in. But uh, the, the other uh, NFTs on this page are worth a couple of hundred dollars. Are they gonna drive up or not? It's, there's so many variables going on at the tournament price. So. Uh, I'm going to jump into the tax area right now, uh, but before I do, I'll just uh, flip to the next slide uh, on page uh, page three. And I won't dwell on this too much, but if you look at the very uh, top transaction, uh, mining activities are really taking off because the, the, the value, the gas fees or whatever you call it, the very first transaction, and this is what's interesting about blockchain, you can trace through all the transactions. You don't know who the individuals are by those coded numbers, but in that first transaction, there are 368 transactions in 33 seconds, and the fees awarded were 2.12 Ether, uh, which translates into about $7,200. So what's happening is the mining activity, we've seen a number of companies come over from China. It's not in, uh, it's not really looked on fondly in China. So the number of companies, mining enterprises are moving to the US, Ohio, uh, states like that where there's cheap access to energy. But anyway, we'll see a lot of a lot more mining activities. We can go to the next slide uh, four. So in, in the IRS world, I, I would say it's still the wild west. Um, the IRS is struggling with this. Essentially, if you're with Coinbase, then they're tracking transactions. They feel good that you get a 1099. But once you're in the area of wallets, uh, those are private um, ledgers and there's no self-reporting. Um, so the IRS is grappling with this. But initially, they, they did issue at least some direction on how do you classify what to report. So in uh, 2014, they issued a notice and they basically came out with a definition saying uh, tokens, cryptocurrency, it's, it's virtual currency as they refer to it, but it's, it's not taxed like a currency like francs or uh, pesos. It's not that kind of currency, a special set of rules. It's basically, uh, and it's not a stock or security, uh, although for legal purposes, uh, it could be if there's a major issuance or an ICO. Uh, for tax purposes, it's property. And it generally, it's, it's a capital asset. So if you're buying and selling uh, tokens, NFTs that you haven't graded, uh, you're gonna pay capital gains tax. If it's held over a year, you'll get long-term gain and the top tax rate is down below there. Uh, what happens if you're awarded uh, tokens for your mining activities. And this notice clearly set out, this is a trader business. It's like you're a self-employed individual, it's ordinary income, and it's also subject to self-employment tax. So as a, as a general rule, if you're really in a, an active business where you're making a market, uh, as opposed to an investor, you're subject to the top rates of tax uh, plus self-employment tax. So it's a pretty steep tax rate. Um, if you're operating in the U.S., you're just paying, basically estimating your taxes and paying on a quarterly basis. Uh, corporations, uh, there, there are two types of company activities. Uh, one is basically 
uh, if you're an active trader business, or even if it's capital gains. Uh, so an active trader business, a, a good example is if you're building out a platform and you're going to issue uh, utility tokens that are going to raise some uh, funding for the company. Well, companies are subject to a flat tax rate on active trade of business and capital gains. So there's, there's no real distinction, whereas individually, you've got capital gain uh, long term if you hold it more than a year, which in some cases isn't really applicable. People are flipping these things quickly. But for companies, it's a flat 21% rate. If you have capital gains, uh, once again, there's no distinction. Uh, so in Elon Musk's case, uh, I think Tesla unloaded uh, two or three billion dollars. Uh, while investing in crypto isn't Tesla's activity, is basically the tax is taxed the same way. Uh, if you're creating tokens, you're issuing tokens, uh, kind of like a phone card for future services. Uh, generally, when you receive the cash for those I uh, call them uh, uh, utility tokens. That's going to be ordinary income. But once again, w once you have things run in a corporation, it's pretty straightforward as far as uh, dealing with what the tax outcomes. Just have to net everything out at the end of the year and determine your taxable income, capital gain or otherwise. Foreign taxpayers is a really big subject. I'm going to touch on a little bit more later on, but there are a lot of funds. In, I know we have a number of bankers from major banks with international operations. So generally, uh, foreign investors, if they're trading in tokens, they're outside the U.S. These are investments, uh, unless they happen to have U.S. residents or there's a foreign company uh, with the U.S. presence. Foreign investors, even if it's a U.S. token, these are, uh, going back to the definitions, just uh, property, like a stock. Uh, not technically a stock. Uh, someone said it's more like a commodity. So foreign investors uh, in going in and out, foreign companies investing in and out of tokens, and this is up in the cloud, so they don't really have a presence in the U.S. On the other hand, if you have a foreign company with an office, a real active trader business in the U.S., a presence here with employees, they have to deal with all the regular U.S. rules uh, and, 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 and file the terms. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, IRS guidance, it's been pretty sparse, really. Uh, so here are a couple of references. Uh, there was a rev ruling, uh, and you can uh, search this on Google and, and read for yourself. Uh, 2019, it included a whole list of FAQs, which uh, I'm referencing down below. And the FAQs, they don't really clarify that much. Uh, is it, How do you tax the gains? Well, it's property, it's not currency. Uh, it's it's capital gain or loss. Uh, it it actually doesn't address airdrops. It does touch on forks, um, and so does the chief counsel advice memorandum. Uh, it's it's 4020. So uh, there's there have been a number of hard forks where a major uh, virtual currency will split, and essentially uh, these forks uh, creating a new currency. The IRS's view is that's going to be ordinary income. It's taxed when you receive it. And that brings up a whole host of issues. Um, at the bottom, I referenced a Jarrett case. And so this, uh, there, there, there's two questions. Is it taxable? Almost always yes, if you benefit from some token award. The question is, when is it taxable? So the Jarrett case, is sort of pioneering new areas as to when uh, things are taxable. So for example, if you get a reward because you've invested in some token or in some exchange, you can be assigned a reward. Uh, do you have restrictions on that reward? Do you have constructive receipt? So the whole area, the Jared case basically was a situation where the investors did do staking, they did get rewards, they paid tax on it, and then they realized, oh, um, we haven't really monetized out of this this uh, reward or the basic token. So they filed for a refund. Initially, the IRS wouldn't allow the refund, but then uh, they later stepped up and said, okay, we'll issue the refund. 
But then the taxpayer wants to take this case all the way to, to through tax court to get an actual ruling. And, and simply put, the Jarrett sort of a pro approach was, well, I'm like a baker. I've got a product. I'm going to stake it and I get rewards, but I don't really, I shouldn't really pay tax on this until I sell my cake. Uh, it's not until I've really monetized it. And so because the amounts involved were so small, the IRS didn't want to take it to court, but the Jarrett's themselves are pushing this uh, to try to get a ruling. Uh, the IRS was happy to walk away and give them a refund. But uh, if you watch the Jarrett case, it's going to have a lot of implications on the timing of when rewards or staking benefits are, are required to be reported. Um, the other chief counsel advice on 1031 exchanges uh, is actually related to prior, there's a major tax act passed at the end of 2017. And so for trades uh, exchanges of tokens prior to 2018, there was a lot of controversy. Uh, could you get tax-free exchange treatment like if you're swapping real estate or you sell a property, you don't take the cash, you reinvest it. The IRS basically said, well, we're looking at Litecoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and we don't view these tokens as equivalent for like kind property. So they, they ruled against the taxpayer uh, for transactions before 2018. After 2017 or 2018 forward, there's no dispute. Uh, the legislation came out and it basically said uh, crypto tokens are not eligible for 1031 treatment. So you can't swap around and think you can tax defer it. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide here. Uh, page. Okay. Just going through a few accounting to give you some idea of what you have to track or how you deal with this if you're an active investor. Uh, generally, if you have something called a sale or exchange, you're going to trigger a taxable event. So if you're holding Ether and you bought it for X and it's now worth Y and you swap it or sell it, uh, you're going to have income recognition. Again, no, no 1031. Uh, tax deferral on exchanges. Uh, how do you keep your books and records? Uh, if you're in and out of tokens, there, there are a number of rules uh, in the accounting world, the tax accounting world, and, and generally uh, first in, first out. So if you are buying a number of tokens and selling those tokens, it, it comes down to keeping a good set of records, which is a challenge. Um, I, back to my son, I, I asked him how he's tracking his token exchanges. And he, in, in this area, it's all over the map. Uh, unless you're with an established exchange issuing 1099s, it's, it's your books and records. And so the, the obligation is on the individual to maintain uh, adequate books and records. Are you selling the first uh, token or Ether token or are you specifically identifying because it has a higher cost basis and you would rather sell that uh, and reduce the tax? Or is it the, la the la last in first down? The key is if you keep track and there's software packages out there, if, uh, you need to just maintain consistency. Uh, haven't yet seen IRS audits on this. Uh, they will come up. The IRS is really focused on uh, trying to pin down how to tax people uh, based on uh, accounting that often isn't done. Uh, moving from one wallet to another, that's not a sale or exchange. So there, there shouldn't be a taxable event merely from going from, uh, a lot of times uh, individuals will set up a separate wallet. They'll have this, um, a main wallet and then they're gonna do some transacting. They're afraid of uh, hacking. So they'll set up a second wallet for other transactions, whether it's staking or mining, et cetera. And again, uh, it's been looked at a lot. People still want to treat, uh, try to find a way to get like kind of exchange treatment. But right now, there is is no way to get um, tax deferral on exchanges. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to move through this very quickly in the last uh, few slides so we don't run over time. I would talk about NFTs. So if you're 
creating NFTs. Uh, these are uh, um, capital transactions. You're creating uh, an asset, like an artist, like a musician. So if you create or mint your own NFTs and they're out there selling them, that's all ordinary income. Uh, just as a side issue, right now the IRS isn't sure, but they don't like the idea of NFTs being held in IRA accounts. There are certain collectibles that are disallowed to be held from uh, qualified plans. Uh, so that there's yet to be any announcement about the IRS. This is just sort of rumblings that doesn't. Tokens, on the other hand, are okay. That's like a commodity or or a, just a physical, not a physical, but a, an intangible asset. But collectibles fall into a uh, quirky area. So, so probably you want to get some advice before you try uh, your Roth IRA on investing in NFTs. Okay, next slide. Uh, what are the consequences of setting up a business with uh, tokens? Generally, pretty good. Uh, if you're with other investors and for whatever reason, you're going to form a partnership or a corporation, uh, you can contribute your tokens uh, your NFTs to a partnership or corporation uh, tax-free. There, there was some controversy initially. Um, say, for example, uh, you had Ethereum and one of the other investors had Bitcoin and other exchange assets, uh, tokens. Uh, in some cases, if you're basically diversifying from what was a holding in one or two tokens to going into a company or partnership, that had a whole lot of tokens, so you all of a sudden diversified your, your ownership. Uh, so far, the IRS hasn't taken that on. That's still okay, and the reason is tokens are not considered a stock for tax purposes. So you can go into partnerships or corporations, assign your assets at the beginning, and get uh, equity back or equity in tokens if you're also issuing tokens. Uh, next slide. So we see a lot of these corporate structures uh, in place. Um, this is a, a interesting area. So let's say, and we've had this come up several times, and I, I, nobody yet is uh, stepping up to the plate. The question is uh, QSBS. So if you and several investors purchase stock in a qualified U.S. business, uh, active trader business, uh, and that business issues you stock, if it's qualified, if it's a qualified U.S. company and you sell that stock after a hold period of five years, you can exclude uh, 10 million or more of the capital gain. So the questions come at us a number of times. Well, what happens about uh, investors set up a company, they incorporate it, and it issues stock? Okay, that's great. Qualified for this uh, exclusion if you hold it for five years. But what if you're also getting utility tokens or equity tokens? Utility tokens, forget it. That's just a commodity. Um, you're not going to get stock treatment. But if you look at equity tokens, they can mirror the same terms, the same legal rights as a stock. So why shouldn't an equity token issued by a company, U.S. company, a qualified U.S. company, why shouldn't that also satisfy the QSBS, so if there's a later sale, if you're willing to hold on to it for five years, uh, for this $10 million QSBS exclusion. Uh, so far, I haven't found, uh, the law firms want to stay away from calling equity tokens uh, equivalent to stock, it gets to the, the securities area. Uh, but when you drill down, they, they really should qualify, but most advisors are hesitant to say equity tokens can get you the same QSBS exclusion as stock. So if you're thinking about it, um, get good counsel. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, I'm just going to touch on this. It's a complicated, uh, Eric mentioned about ICOs. And uh, so here's an example of a transaction we helped uh, 2018 and 19. A company was formed called Nuco and it raised a significant amount of cash with uh, something called a SAF or a simple agreement for future tokens. It's kind of like a debt instrument. So the buyers up top are buying uh, a debt-like instrument, seem to get away from this around the securities issues. But it's a future token you're buying. So for tax purposes, uh, this platform 
below that was going to provide services, the tokens could be used to purchase those services. The platform didn't actually kick into gear for two years. So they raised $45 million uh, for tokens that funded the company. It wasn't taxable income because it was like convertible debt. Uh, when the platform was final, and the tokens were then released over a period of two years. Then the staggered period, as uh, two to three years later, uh, the token income had to be picked up by the company. It was a huge deferral of recognition of tax, and tax business deferral is a big deal. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll go through uh, uh, just a, a reference. Uh, a lot of employers are using tokens like stock options and the rules are interesting but for key employees sometimes when the stock value is really high it's hard to award employees uh, stock without a huge tax consequence if the company is already dealing with uh, or going to issue tokens for whatever its services are that's a, an opportunity or way for a company to issue potentially very high value for almost a nominal amount so it nullifies the tax consequences whereas issuing stock that has identifiable value it, it, it's problematic when the company's worth a lot uh, next couple of slides that i'm going to be wrapping it up in, the, in a minute or two um, why don't we go on to the next slide this is these are complex foreign rules i'll just give everybody a warning uh, if you're going to play around with foreign companies be careful so in this example, uh, U.S. investors transferring uh, tokens to a foreign company. Where there's a lot of trading activity, two things happen. If you transfer appreciated assets to a foreign company, uh, that's a taxable event right of, immediately. If the activity in the foreign company is, is uh, basically investment trading, that'll also flow up to the uh, controlling U.S. investors. So dealing with foreign companies doesn't defer the tax. It can trigger and turn capital gains in ordinary income. Uh, next, next slide. Um, why don't I flip and, and just go to the following the PFIX slide. This is a very complicated area with foreign companies uh, actively doing business offshore. But if you go to the next slide, uh, 15, uh, be aware if you're investing in foreign funds that are trading crypto, foreign funds uh, generally get defined to be Pass the foreign investment company status. The outcome is that the trading activity in these foreign funds, uh, you can either pick it up currently by an election, but if you wait and defer recognition of that income till you later sell or get a distribution, you incur ordinary income tax plus an interest charge, which really, after if you defer something for 12 years, the tax consequences are greater than the actual income you're recognizing. So be aware if you're dropping money into uh, through your brokerage account or whatever in the foreign funds, uh, you have to check to see if it's a PFIC uh, uh, entity or not. Um, next slide. Uh, I'm going to look at, just advise on one particular compliance issue here. It's 14457. This is the second and first and second point. <laughs> Since 2019, tax forms have required you to disclose that you disclose if you're act, if you're holding or trading a crypto account. So the IRS in February came out with a voluntary compliance uh, update. So if you think because of non-disclosure of your trading activities, whether onshore or offshore, and you may be subject to criminal evasion for not reporting it or not checking the box, um, this is the form. <laughs> you and your advisor have to go through and and this is a really tough area um, if somebody steps up and they we've had clients or new prospects they had several million dollars of trading two years ago they didn't report it so the irs has now upgraded their voluntary compliance to include crypto transactions that haven't been reported and there's no standard answer as to what to do if, if there are no criminal if you've got good advice and what you've done is or you got a tax opinion or you've been well advised you probably don't have to deal with this form but if you've just blown past a lot of transactions without reporting uh and it's significant you've got 
uh, a problem, you might you might want to deal with uh, counsel and their privilege as you go through this this tax form, which you can go, go up on the web. And the the rest of the forms down below, if you're playing around with crypto offshore, you've got a lot of disclosures. So don't overlook these. These are significant penalty areas for non non compliance. And that's it. Uh, hope I haven't scared you away. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. All right, now I'm on mute. Back, back to you, Dan. Right, thank you so much for that. Um, I will say there's comments uh, coming in, uh, giving praise to everybody for their presentation and the information. So it was excellent. Thank you so much. And Brian, your conversation and Eric's before that, I used to be a partner in a global law firm for a long time and I'd bring clients in and I'd talk to securities people and have to talk to tax people. And it reminded me the only thing that required more handholding than talking to the securities partner was talking to the tax partner. So <laughs> often trying to translate things because uh, it, it, it's a lot of information and really uh, difficult to comprehend for those who are uh, frankly not familiar with any of it, right? So we have a number of questions. Um, we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna to try to consolidate a few, uh, ask uh, a couple directly from the chat here. And, um, you know, we're just not gonna to get to them all. I don't wanna keep everybody uh, too much over. Uh, Brian, there was one question. What's the tax implication for if an NFT gets stolen? Okay, um, that's happening a lot of these days for fraud. So basically, let's say you purchased an NFT for $10,000 and, and it's stolen. Um, there are provisions for theft losses, uh, 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 basically storm loss, uh, flood loss, uh, casualty and theft loss. So it would probably just come under theft loss provisions and you can't. Yeah, not, nothing particularly unusual. Um, I sort of have a question. You're talking about exchanging uh, one, currency, one uh, crypto for another. And that would be a taxable transaction uh, right. potentially, but um, but um, is it a, if you use it as a currency, which is you know frankly not that used yet? Um, so you're buying something with it. You're you're giving somebody you know uh, some Bitcoin, and you're buying a car or whatever, a rocket. If Elon's selling rockets with crypto or whatever. Um, that is also a taxable transaction based on, I guess, capital gains between the amount you bought it for, the amount of value, and what you got in exchange for it, right? Right. You, you have to just go back to sort of standard tax rules. So, you, you know, if you bought a security uh, a stock in a company and uh, you bought it for $5,000 and it's worth twenty, and and you assigned that or gave that over for purchase of a car, you've triggered the realization. So yeah. th those same rules, a lot of the yeah. traditional tax rules still apply. Once you start with, hey, it's just an asset that you're using, um, just a, it's an intangible asset, but the right. formal rules and the FAQs will get you through. The, those but interestingly, I think you said that if you uh, used it as co capital contribution to a company and you got equity in return, that is not a taxable transaction. So it's more an exception. Uh, right, right. That's a good a good point. There are partnership and corporate rules. When you're initially setting up the company, you can assign appreciated assets in exchange for the stock. Or right. your tax basis stays the same. That's fully an exception, and that's often done. Uh, so that that's yeah, good point. Right. Um, and this may be a general question for a lot of people. Like um, I, I know some advocates of crypto who just think crypto is bulletproof and never is going away. But if a lot of other countries did what China's doing, let's say the US and Europe basically just said, no mining, no activity, no nothing, uh, which is basically what China did and didn't have that big of effect on the market, which is a little, I thought that was interesting. Uh, what does that say for the future of any cryptos if basically governments outlaw them? Well, people want to transact and save money. Um, I mean, if all governments outlawed it, it it's going to uh, fall into a pure black market. Yeah. But it's not going to stop trading. Uh, yeah, I would, I would assume the price yeah. would fall. It'd be less there's, there's been too much. There's been too much invested in the infrastructure that powers uh, yeah. crypt, cryptocurrencies and digital assets to this point. Um, you know, and, and indicative of that, that is. 
the about face that uh, JP Morgan Chase yeah. has taken <clears throat> on crypto, uh, in fact, setting up a trading floor. Yeah. So don't, ex don't expect uh, other governments to go the way of China. Uh, expect more regulation. All right. And then, Eric, uh, you're expecting uh, on the regulation point, uh, the regulation of the whole crypto scene is just starting. Is that, I mean, the, the attorney general is quite keen on it and he's like pretty keen to be aggressive on it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's just starting. It's obviously now before people were kind of ignoring it to some extent and what yeah. is this, right? But it's, it's got the attention of senior policymakers. Um, yeah, but you have an interesting dynamic here as, as you're probably aware, it's, it's very difficult to get any law being done in the United States at a federal yeah. level. And so you have different points of view and kind of areas, questions of like where you will get people to agree on things enough to actually mm -hmm. pass new legislation. And so then the question becomes, what do the, the regulatory agencies feel comfortable with that they are able to do on their own um, in the shadow of that? And what is also interesting is there, there's clearly a lot more, um, you know, kind of you know, the, the crypto lobby is, is gaining an influence well, within the US Congress. And once the uh, lobbyists get in there, yeah, it's never going away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it's kind of a little bit related on the maybe the political and policy side of things is, uh, you know, the IRS just gets less and less funding almost every round. Uh, how are they possibly going to have enough money to chase down voluntary reporting almost? Or um, how are they ever going to just even uncover uh, a, a, a crypto, unless you're in a Coinbase or some other sort of exchange that tra tracks those transactions, how does the IRS even know that a transaction has happened? How will they know this is a taxable transaction? If they're private wallets, they don't. Yeah, <laughs> and until, so they, until the IRS gets a lot of quantum computers and cracks all the codes and grabs all the data. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, the thing about blockchain is that because it is a distributed ledger, all the transactions are right there on the chain. So the wallet addresses are all available. And uh, it turns out it's incredibly easy to trace every transaction all the way back to the original coin uh, when it was minted. So you, if, you know, if you were to perform an audit of the entire Bitcoin blockchain, for example, you could find all the wallets that have ever existed on it. And then uh, it would be a somewhat complicated matter, but um, using metadata from other sources, you can do a bit of forensics and uncover the identities of the holders of those wallets. Now that's a, a, a massive undertaking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it yeah, is no, it's it's a big issue. So yeah, there is a Biden proposal to provide uh, uh, 1.2 billion for IRS funding and four partly for crypto. Uh, does yeah. it prove? We don't know, but it's a proposal because the IRS is massively understaffed and not able to take this area on. Yeah, uh, that's that's a big part of my point. It's like they don't really have the tools or the resources to do that, right? Um, all right, I, I guess we'll wrap it up there. Uh, we're about five minutes over. So we appreciate both everybody staying with us online and everybody, uh, the contributors, uh, Justin, uh, Eric, and Brian, thank you so much. Uh, it's been really helpful for me personally, and uh, I'm sure for all the, uh, the attendees. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't think, thank Yanni and Michelle for setting this up. They did a great job. Thank you very much. Um, and you'll see on the screen uh, a couple of our upcoming events. Um, uh, uh, economic Outlook and Opportunities, um, uh, supported by the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office. Uh, that is coming up on May 5th, so you're welcome to come to that. And then we have another one, an interesting uh, closer look in global inflation. We have um, uh, uh, Paul Sherd in particular, uh, who's a friend of the Hong Kong Association of New York, and he's also uh, the Harvard School uh, with Larry Summers. He's like the, the lesser known name uh, of the duo and uh, he'll largely be talking about how inflation is probably, and he won't be the first one, but driven more by logistics and supply chain dis dis uh, disruptions than monetary and fiscal policies. But you know, that's a, that's a good argument to have uh, for wonks that like to talk about such things. But those are coming up and uh, we hope you join us. And um, 
They, there's some information on there about how to contact us. And I think that's it. So thank you for joining and we hope to see you next time. And again, thank you so much uh, for the three of our panelists for uh, spending part of their evening with us.